Hello, this is the Jaguar Maven podcast. Uh, thank you for tuning in. This is our first episode, uh, you know, traditional with the Jaguar Maven timing. We waited until about uh, week 10 of the season to finally get the podcast up and off the ground, uh, just like we waited about a week before the season to get the site up and off the ground. But we're, uh, we're excited to finally uh, be on here at the Jaguar Maven podcast. I'm real excited to you know, bring you guys our takes through audio. And uh, I'm here with uh, one of my staff members, a guy who, you know, I've I've had the pleasure of knowing these past few weeks. He's killed it over at Jaguar Maven. Yeah, you should definitely follow him for the good takes on Twitter. His name is uh, Treeb, and I'll go ahead and let him uh, take away with what he's doing. What is going on, everybody? It's Treeb from Treeb Talks here. You might have heard of me. I got a successful YouTube channel over there called Treeb Talks but uh, John was you know nice enough to kind of build my Jaguar writing career up uh, offering me to be a part of the Jaguar Maven team and I've kind of always wanted to be a part of like a full-time Jags podcast and uh, like he said in a true Jaguar Maven fashion we waited until the bye week to get this up and going and I think during the week I think we had like three day changes of when we were actually going to record it so it's actually nice to be in the studio talking to my guy and talking some jaguar football with you guys and give you guys some hot takes as well yeah no for sure for sure and uh j- just for a record that is completely <laughs> on me the fact <laughs> that's starting to week 10 but i'm i'm really am excited we can finally do this and uh for for those of you uh, you know, at home listening, uh, the uh, background cover art that you do see, that was done by a good friend of mine, Justin Hardy. Uh, you need any design issues, he does Hardy Productions down in Orlando, and he, he just does awesome stuff. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad he could help us kind of get this started. And uh, real quick, I'll, I'll, I'll just let anybody know for anybody who hasn't been reading the site over the last few weeks. And if you haven't, then I, you've been, you know, in my humble, completely professional opinion, missing out on you know, the best Jags analysis out there. But uh, Jaguar Maven is uh, the first ever Sports Illustrated news outlet dedicated to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, it kicked off shortly before uh, week one of the season. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to get the position of publisher with Jaguar Maven. And, you know, I'm boots on the ground uh, there at the stadium about four or five times a week. Uh, you know, going to press conferences, locker room scrums, that kind of stuff for all y'all. And I'm just trying to bring, you know, a new perspective to Jaguar analysis uh, for y'all. You know, obviously the news, but really uh, the other stuff as well. The features, the deep dives into advanced stats and what they mean, that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, with guys like Treeb and the other guys on our team, like Andrew and Brandon, uh, I, I really think that, you know, this is going to be the go-to place for Jaguar analysis. And I'm happy, like like we had mentioned, that, we're finally able to get this podcast off the ground. I think, you know, just like Treep said, it's going to be one of those places where, you know, you guys go to for your Jaguars information. He already has, you know, uh, the most notable YouTube show in uh, YouTube history. If you hadn't heard of it yet, definitely suggest giving him that plug. <laughs> but no, it, it's, uh, we're, we're real excited. So uh, obviously we're going to go ahead and tackle our first show with, uh, you know, the, the most uh, important Jaguar storyline uh, really of the last uh, week and, Really, of the last uh, few weeks since Jalen Ramsey got traded, this has kind of overtaken the news of the Jaguars. And it's uh, obviously the Nick Foles versus Gardner Minshew the second debate. And uh, just for some background context, uh, Nick Foles was paid $88 million over a four-year contract by Jacksonville in the offseason. That's a, he got almost $51 million in guaranteed money, which is the most guaranteed money the, the franchise has given out to any player, like on any contract ever. So it, it's the most sizable investment the team has ever made in a player uh, financially. Uh, Foles went down 11 plays into his first game as a Jaguar. He got sacked by uh, Chris Jones while he threw a 30-something yard touchdown pass to DJ Chark. It was a terrific pass. Uh, he just, you know, kind of landed right under Jones. Jones was able to get his full body weight under him and uh, ended up fracturing his clavicle. Knocked him out for the next uh, eight to nine weeks. And Gardner Minshew, the second uh, six-round pick from Treve's Neck of the Words, uh, kind of, you know, came in and lit the whole NFL on fire. And uh, Treve, I, I just want to get your perspective here. What did you think about Gardner's, uh, you know, first eight NFL starts? And uh, did, did you kind of expect him to play as well as he did? You know, uh, from watching him play at Washington State University, it was very similar but kind of not similar circumstances for when he came in and took over Washington State. So 
obviously their starting quarterback went through a tragic situation, ended up committing suicide, and Gardner Minshew came in and took a organization, a college that was, you know, really down in the dumps and took them to, like, its best season in its history, like in Mm -hmm. Washington State history. And this quarterback that the Jacksonville Jaguars invested all this money into goes down 11 plays in, and Gardner comes in, and he shines. I think Gardner Minshew, for what he has done on the field, I think he's earned himself a shot to be considered the next franchise quarterback of the Jacksonville Jaguars. You know, I was on uh, a podcast earlier today, and we discussed it, and, you know, they said if Foles goes down again or if Foles, you know, doesn't play up to expectations, do you expect the Jaguars to use, you know, one of those first-round picks on a quarterback and honestly I don't because what Gardner has been able to show is a lot of maturity on the field and a lot of you know big boy plays I think that's part of Gardner's game that you don't see in a lot of rookie quarterbacks there are some times he goes out there and there's some rookie tendencies like his fumbles for for instance like Mm -hmm. that is him trying to do too much in the pocket and you know trying to prolong plays that aren't necessarily there but you know with what he has done and what he has been given I think Gardner has done a terrific job and like I said you know he goes out there and he plays like he's been in the NFL for five six years so I was really happy to see what Minshew was able to do yeah. for the Jaguars yeah for sure no and I I, I totally agree with you you know uh, the, the thing I think people kind of forget with rookie quarterbacks is they are generally terrible, you know, like not even like, yeah. oh, they're, they're normally okay. No, they're usually like pretty terrible in their first year or so, you know. There's very rare times that a quarterback steps in his rookie season and is able to like kind of produce like a veteran. And Gardner kind of did that over his, you know, first few games. And I think that kind of skewed, uh, you know, people's uh, opinions a little bit on him, kind of got their expectations set so high for – oh, this is what this kid can do right out of the gate. He needs to be able to sustain this. When really, I think the takeaway should have been, oh, he can have flashes like this right out of the gate. That's encouraging. You know what I mean? I, 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 that, that was just my whole takeaway from especially his last couple starts. But I, I think, like you said, you know, great point. He was able to rally an entire community and or uh, a school around him one year. And then he did, you know, he – rallied a team around him this year he rallied I, I I would honestly go to say he rallied a fan base around him this year because c- can you imagine if you know uh Cody Kessler was still the Jaguars backup quarterback when Nick Foles went down you you, th- you think the fans are going crazy at all for Cody Kessler or anything like that no one's going co- uh crazy for Cody Kessler the only time people are going crazy for Cody Kessler is when you, like Blake Bortles yeah. is playing so bad it's so insane too like I think Another thing that Jaguar fans should appreciate about Gardner Minshew is do you know how many times like Blake Bortles would throw a pass or Blake Bortles would make a decision and you're like what in the absolute world was that like with Gardner Minshew you don't get any of that you know he's a game manager but a game manager that still manages to make a lot of big plays you know what I mean like yeah he makes the smart reads and sometimes the smart reads are deep passes down, you know, down the field. You know, you've seen it in the Jets game with Chris Conley hitting him, you know, 70 yards down the field, seeing he was open. And, you know, he'll take the check down if it's there. And the Houston game was really when he had an opportunity to, you know, I guess earn his right as a, as a starting quarterback for the Jaguars for the remainder of the season. And, you know, people say that, you know, he had a bad game or he choked in that game and kind of threw away his opportunity to be the starter. And, you know, I was kind of like that because I wrote the, uh, the stocks on, uh, on Tuesday yeah. about uh, Gardner Minshew's stock being down. But, you know, I was, I was watching a, a Baldi's breakdown of, you know, Gardner's throws in those games. And, you know, not a lot of, you know, the receivers in the offensive line really did not help Gardner Minshew out that much at all. And, you know, all three of his, you know, turnovers came in with seven minutes to go and a guy like Gardner Minshew is a winner so you know he's going to go out there and try and make those big plays in order to win games and yeah for I sure think 
I think that just all got lost in the fact uh, that people think that he had a bad game when, you know, most of his turnovers came late in the game. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I, I, I had a bit of a, a similar initial reaction. Uh, and I, I normally try to rewatch the game a day or so later or try to at least uh, watch a condensed version. That way I can kind of get my, you know, reactionary takes out of it, the emotion out of it, and then really, you know, go back and examine what really happened. And I, like I, I've been saying on Twitter for the few, last few days, uh, he had he had a mediocre, you know, three quarters. And then a bad fourth quarter. It is not like, you know, from like first snap to final snap that he was flat out, you know, bad. You know, it wasn't like a Blake Bortles versus Kansas City in 2018. Yeah. Uh, the last seven minutes were some definitely some yakety sack stuff. But, I mean, that, that that's going to happen when your team's down multiple possessions. And uh, w- when an offense only scores three points the way it did, uh, that's a complete unit failure. I think it's impossible to pin that on one guy. But – and, you know, it might sound like uh, excuses, but I promise it's not because, like I said, he did not play great at any point in the game. But eventually you got to look at the people around the player too. You got to look at if he was put in the right situations. You got to look at if uh, the players surrounding him, his supporting cast, are uh, playing as well as they can and if he's able to overcome that. And I, I think at times uh, Minshew showed he's able to elevate his supporting cast. And I think at other times he showed that, okay, maybe he would be, you know, better suited if he, you know, was on maybe a little bit more talented in offense, uh, maybe in a scheme a little bit more tailored to him, that kind of stuff. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely with you. I, I thought, you know, considering the fact that he went four and four during his time as a starter, I think you tell anybody that, you know, in the preseason that Foles goes down week one and Minshew goes four and four as a starter. I think anybody takes that, honestly. I, I mean, I, you know, people act like the sky was falling because they lost in London. And don't get me wrong, it was a big missed opportunity. But I think that where they're at in the season compared to where they could have been, I think they're at a good spot right now. So, I, I uh, you know, credit him for keeping the ship afloat. But, um, Treb, uh, let me go ahead and get your take on, uh, you know, really the big debate that has been going on has been uh, Foles versus Minshew. So, uh, let me go ahead and get your take on the decision to start Foles and, let me know if you agree or disagree or why, and then I'll go ahead and give you mine. Okay. First of all, Jags Twitter, please don't come at me because what I'm about to say is an unpopular opinion, but I think the decision to start Nick Foles was a good decision. I think that it, – and it's not even really a money thing – like Nick Foles, when he was playing for the Jags against Kansas City, had that yeah. beautiful touchdown pass to DJ Chark. Yeah. And you got a guy that in Gardner Minshew that you really want to be your future quarterback. You want this guy to be the face of the franchise and you want it now. You know, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. You know, with rookies, they're usually like, if they come in right away, they're terrible. They're bad. Gardner Minshew went in there, showed some poise, and showed that he can always elevate his game. Now, I don't think benching Minshew is worst-case scenario for him because this is going to give him more of an opportunity to kind of, you know, have the earbuds in, have the headset on, and, you know, watch the game and see where Nick Foles messes up and where Nick Foles, you know, makes those good decisions. And, you know, that's just going to add on to his game. And there's every chance in the world that, you know, Foles does go out there and he doesn't have a great turnaround. He doesn't have a great game. And, you know, that might throw Foles on like the trade block or something. And Gardner's going to end up starting quicker than you think. But I think as of right now for the Jacksonville Jaguars in week 11 of the season, when you have a guy like Nick Foles who has proved that, you know, he hits his stride late in NFL season. So that's when Nick Foles strives is late late in the season. And I think that, as an organization, this was the best choice to make. And I still think Gardner Minshew is the future of the Jaguars, you know, whether that be next year, two years, three years, whatever it is, I think Gardner Minshew still has a spot on this team and still has an opportunity to grab the franchise by the horns. And I think it's silly for like Mm -hmm. all these media outlets that I'm seeing saying that the Jaguars might try and trade Gardner Minshew. You don't. Yeah. Gardner Minshew. Yeah, no, that's and, that's been one of the more ludicrous things of this whole situation that I've seen. Somebody's like, should you flip him to the Bears like a third? And no. I'm like, no, no. Wh- what? No. <laughs> so so your backup can be, uh, you know, who exactly? <laughs> you know, like it's just it's so it's so silly. It's like, and and I don't I don't see Jags fans. You know, are the ones 
or, you know, even Jags media outlets are the ones saying that we should trade Minshew. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's people that don't know what's going on really inside that organization and what they have. Like, the Jags haven't had a good quarterback ever. Can, can we say, like, Mark they, Brunel, you know, they, I wasn't – they've, the they, they've had good quarterback play in terms of, like, sustained, consistent, like – no, they haven't. No. Yeah, yeah, and you know, you got a guy in Gardner Minshew who I don't think really had a game where you look at him and you say, "Damn, kid, you did terrible." Like, let's let's like not even like his worst game that he had this season was probably Blake Bortles' best game that he would have in a regular season. I was, I was gonna say, I feel like there's any game like that. The Saints game is probably the closest one, but I saw, like you had said, the fifth-year veteran who just got a contract extension have several of those Saints games last season. You know, so hundred percent. Yeah, no. So I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on a lot of aspects of that. And when you brought up uh, the fact that Foles is kind of made for these situations, uh, four and five going into you know week ten, week eleven, needing to win almost every game to make the playoffs. That is literally like. Nick Foles, like his bread and butter, dude. Like, yeah, 100%. Dude, dude is built for elimination games, you know? And so he's kind of walking into a situation that he's walked into uh, before, you know? I mean, it's a little more precarious because now he's the one coming off an injury. So I think that is a little bit of a change element. But yeah, this is definitely something he's done before. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, try to put this uh, in the best, uh, you know, kind of phrasing I can. Well, I understand the calls to keep uh, Minshew in because once you got that young, successful quarterback on a cheap rookie deal, to me there is no greater advantage in sports than a than a good quarterback on a rookie deal. But if I was Doug Marone, I would have done the exact same thing that he did because you got to think about it from the Jaguars, uh, you know, perspective. He needs to win games, you know, at least get the eight to eight, nine to seven, you know that kind of record to keep his job secure. His job, of course, is to develop players, but his first job is to win games. If I'm him, you know, I, I'm probably going to think that the veteran gives me a better chance to win games right now than, than the rookie does, just because, and I've seen Coach Marone mention this several times in interviews the last couple of days, uh, they, they put in months and months and months in folds in the playbook. They know exactly uh, who he is, what he kind of likes in there, and they were kind of – kind of a little bit improvising with Gardner, you know. Uh, mm. J.P. Shadrick asked Marone uh, in an interview on Jaguars.com if he thinks it's going to be hard to tailor the offense back to Foles. And he's like, no, I think it was harder to tailor it to Gardner just because we were going in there with an unknown and we didn't really know what he could do when the lights came on. So I, I completely understand the decision to go back to Foles uh, from Marone's perspective. And when it comes down to it, Gardner Minshew is halfway through his rookie season as a Jaguar. You know, he's not going anywhere for the next couple of years. Uh, if the 2019 season has showed anybody anything, it's that you have no idea <laughs> what is going to go on in an NFL season, you know. I mean, did nobody in nobody in the right mind thought Gardner Minshew was going to come in and start half the season for the Jaguars this year. You know, I mean, it, it, it's just not a scenario people had floating out there. So I'm not going to be one to say, you know, you know, Foles has a strangle, stranglehold on this job now. Uh, nobody knows what hap- what can happen in the future. Uh, all, let, me, all we... let, me t- let me tell you something. Go for it. I, uh, the other day, it was like two weeks ago, um, I had uploaded a video yeah. during the draft when we drafted Gardner Minshew. And I, literally, I had not been more excited for a draft pick since we drafted Jalen Ramsey in 2016. Yeah. Like I was, and it was a six round draft pick nonetheless. I was so excited because I I'd just seen what Garner did at WSU. I was covering him. It was awesome. And I was really excited to see him come in. So what I said in that video was Nick Foles is going to go down. Gardner Minshew is going to take us to the promised land and everybody's going to forget about Nick Foles and Gardner's going to be, you know, the face of the franchise. So I totally forgot. I uploaded that video. Totally forgot exactly <laughs> what I said in that video (laughs) and and like literally two weeks ago that video gets three two two three thousand views out of nowhere and everybody's like oh this guy knows what he's talking about i'm like (laughs) i was totally just messing around hey man 
it, when when the broken clock can you know hit the correct time. You know, I, I swear, <laughs> man, a, a solid thirty percent of my takes are accidentally right, and you know it's just like drafting a potential franchise quarterback in the sixth round. You know, uh, j- trust the results, not the process. Uh, don't, don't don't worry about how we got there. Just <laughs> worry that worry that we got there. See, this is why John offered me the job because he knew that I knew that Gardner Minshew was uh, the future of the franchise. He's like, if he's coming up with takes like that, I mean, God, he's the best there is. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it was like right around uh, when we got together to put the staff out. I saw you have that picture with Gardner, like when he went to yeah. uh, <laughs> back to uh, Washington State, you know, after the Thursday night game. And, I, and you're like, uh, thanks for making the Jaguars fun again. And I was like, all right, yeah, this, this, was, a, this was a good ad. <laughs> all right man uh this was the guy for the job yeah <laughs> all right man uh so uh you know now we talked a little bit about the decision uh what is kind of your expectation you know for uh this uh you know team now that it's a uh, Foles team do you think the offense will change or improve that drastic that drastically with Foles uh, in the lineup instead of Minshew I think one thing that you will notice drastically that will in cha- that will change is that I think the red zone efficiency is going to step up. You know, that was, that was the big thing with this whole Jaguar offense. Leonard Fournette has one rushing touchdown. Gardner Minshew, you know, would struggle in the red zone. And, you know, with John DeFilippo, like you said, you know, has basically tailored this whole offense to, you know, benefit Nick Foles. And, you know, Foles is deep into that playbook. I think he's going to be able to put the Jaguars in situations where they score touchdowns. And I think that's why the Jags have a real realistic shot at trying to make the push for the wild card um, spot, at least the sixth seed. Um, but I think that's a, that's a long shot at this point. I think Houston, Houston really was a heartbreaker because that was a game the Jags needed to win. Um, I think they could have afforded, you know, if they beat Houston and if they came off the bye and they lost to Indy, I think that that's a loss you could kind of, you know, come back from. But, you know, to go back to a losing record and to, you know, lose Gardner Minshew and, you know, to kind of start over as a team, you know, it, I don't think the playoffs are necessarily in reach for the Jags right now. I think that the Jags have an opportunity to mm-hmm. go like eight and eight, nine and seven, seven and nine, something like that. But if if the Jags go five and eleven, six and ten, yeah, uh, with Nick Foles at the helm, or if Foles goes down and they have that record, I'd I'd expect a lot of uh, a lot of changes inside that coaching would, staff. Would you do a fresh quarterback competition uh, next fall, or would you kind of you know uh, once again you know it's a Foles' job, but this time you know it's kind of his job to lose. I think if the Jags go – if they win six games, five games, or seven games, mm-hmm. and Foles is healthy and he's fine and he's out there and he's the quarterback and, you know, he's inconsistent, I definitely think absolutely there should be an open – there should be an open job there. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the front office, man, it's just – it's so hard to get a read on them because, you know, it seems like they're more – worried about the money that they're investing in the players so I think they might still look at it as the fact that they gave Foles all this money they gave him all of this and that's not me saying that I think that's the best case scenario but that's just just, kind of what you would see yeah it just seems like that's what it is yeah no I I I think the Jaguars have to be real bad over the next seven games for Foles to not go in as at very least a favorite to be their 2020 quarterback. But, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of with you, uh, you know, in terms of playoffs, you know, being in reach, uh, they need to go at least, uh, you know, six and one, five and two over the next seven games to be in that conversation. You know, uh, winning the AFC South became incredibly difficult after the Houston loss. But in terms of wild card, I, they're, they're still uh, in that playoff picture right now. I, I believe they are eighth right behind the Pittsburgh Steelers. who are at seven somehow, some way right now. Oh, I and, know, dude. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, dude, that, that is. And uh, But fortunately for the Jaguars, they've already kind of got through their tough part of the season, you know. And, and, and I, I don't think that's something that needs to be scoffed at either, man. I mean, Jaguars had some tough games first half of the season, man. Like, you start off the season with KC – you play Houston Trice, you play the Panthers, you play the Saints. Like, they got a couple of gifts in there, like the Jets and the Bengals. But they, they, they played some tough teams first half of the season. Uh, over the second half of the season, 
hot. I feel like the Colts are really the only team on there that you could really classify as a good team. You know, like a few of the teams are frisky, but Colts, I think, are the only one that you could say are good. Would you agree with that? I like I like how you use the word frisky because I think that's the best word to describe those teams because yeah. I think Oakland and the Chargers – because the Jags always struggle against the Chargers like good every man. single time they play them, every time, no matter what. They will struggle against them. So that's not a gimme to them. And I don't know if you watch Thursday Night Football, but I kind of like how the Raiders are playing football right now. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point. That That's definitely a game I think a lot of people circled in, like, before the season started as a definite win. And yeah. right now, that, that one looks a lot different. And I, I'll agree with you on that one. Uh, my, my, my thought on that is, uh, can you imagine if the Chargers came into Jacksonville and the Jaguars lost to a Gus Bradley defense? <sighs> just, I don't even just, want to just, talk about it. Just, just the outpour of uh, 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 um, it, emotions. You know, it, 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 it'd be therapeutic, honestly, for a lot of people, I feel like. But I, I, I think that's a reality in most people. <laughs> like, not to think well, about. well, and that kind of raises the question, because I've seen some people talking about it on Twitter. Do you think – and it might have been you, actually. I don't know who it was. But uh, do you think Gus Bradley is going to get another head coaching job somewhere? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. You don't, dude? No. Nah. Uh, not, not, not in the NFL. Like not in the NFL. I think I think you could get one in college. I think he is legitimately too nice of a guy to be an NFL head coach. And that is the nicest compliment I can give <laughs> somebody in saying I do not think they're a good NFL head coach. I I, I I think his tenure with the Jags and the fact that you saw them get that much better his first season away from the team, I think that's kind of uh, muddied his uh, – head coaching chances at, at least at least a little bit what I mean what about you I I don't I don't think I don't think he uh he will but um I think he's doing he's doing an all right job with the Chargers yeah. defense I yeah. think he's uh I think he has you know I can see like maybe a team that's struggling maybe try to get him and then it ends up like being like the Jag situation it's like a one two year thing but you know, uh, I think if he wants to continue, you know, to be respected, and I think if he wants to continue to be, like, a guy that people respect, that he should just stick as a defensive coordinator, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I hear I hear Okay, uh, so, uh, Treve, just, uh, you know, getting into, uh, you know, the Houston Texans game, you know, we, we've talked a little bit of Minshew Foles already. Uh, when it comes to the Houston Texans game, uh, what do you really point to that – uh, went wrong. I know we were both kind of in agreement that, you know, it wasn't all on Minshew, but what do you think really went wrong uh, over season in London for the Jaguars? You know, during my, uh, during my recap video, I think as far as on the Jaguars, what went wrong, the offensive line really did not perform, you know, in the stock article that I wrote over on jaguarmaven.com. Um, I talked about how that Brandon Scarlett guy got two sacks and like, the most he had in a single season up to that point was like two and a half. And then, you know, you got J.J. Watt out of the game and this offensive line still could not hold up. They couldn't get to the second level. The run game wasn't working. Yeah. So the that, receivers were dropping it. That, that was my big thing with that game. Dude, the Texans were missing, like you had said, J.J. Watt. And then they were missing a few other guys, dude. They were missing Bradley Roby, Lonnie yep. Johnson, uh, Deshaun Gibson. But – their defense didn't one didn't play like it, and the Jaguars' offense didn't play like they were missing anybody. You know, they, I feel like they still kind of played like JJ Watt was out there. You know, they were doing a ton, a ton of max protect and like two man routes, and I and that, that was my biggest thing watching the game. I'm like, you know, what one of your biggest advantages is they do not have that guy at the defensive line, and what are you guys doing to take advantage of that? You know what I mean? Yeah, I get that, and then I also think. Like, my my hat's off to the Houston Texans, honestly. Like, Deshaun Watson in that game played literally perfect. Like, there was not a flaw to his game whatsoever. Like, the Jags had him on the ground on that one play, knees bare, like, about to touch the ground, and he just dumps it off to Carlos Hyde, and then he gets a 10-yard game. You know, like, Carlos Hyde tore us up again. It's like, from the week two game, the Jaguars learned nothing and they didn't like, it just seemed like they were unprepared. Seemed like they didn't have a game plan 
on how to attack this team. And that's why I just have – that's why I have a problem with Todd Wash sometimes because it just doesn't seem like he – schemes or he like game plans for anything because it's literally the same exact result as the week two game other than Deshaun Watson didn't really you know perform at that high of a level in the week two game but Carlos Hyde still tore us up in the week two game and he tore us up again in London so you know it it always sucks for me being on the west coast getting up at 6 30 in the morning and watching terrible Jaguar football so that 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 too just added on to the to the badness of that game and yeah, I mean, my, my big thing was, you know, a lot of people talked, uh, you know, when it came to, uh, you know, Sunday uh, Sunday's game against Texans, a lot of people talked about Jalen Ramsey not no longer being there, being a big factor. Even though the Texans scored twice as many points on offense uh, this past Sunday than they did in week two when Ramsey was there shutting down Hopkins, I didn't think the lack of Ramsey was a big reason why. Did you? I didn't think that Jalen Ramsey – not being there was, you know, the catalyst of the Texans just going off. I think, I think a lot of just underpreparedness, man. Like, you've seen this defense really play at the same level that they have played on consistently without Jalen Ramsey. And, I mean, you know, you can make that argument that, oh, the two games you played against, you know, without Ramsey were against the Bengals and against the Jets. But, you know, Trey Herndon, I think, is developing. And I think he's getting better, you know, week in, week out. But um, I like I said, man, I don't think that we necessarily miss Jalen Ramsey because, you know, Ramsey would be following DeAndre Hopkins and A.J. Boye followed DeAndre Hopkins that whole game. And, you know, Boye, I think, is a guy that really showed that he was always primed to be a number one corner. You know, you go into like that 2017 season and there there was like a debate amongst fans that, you know, who is the better corner? Is it Jalen Ramsey? Is it A.J. Boye? And I think Boye really showed that, uh, you know, he's a viable option at that number one corner spot. And yeah, I think for that, sure. uh, that he's, you know, that guy. Yeah, no, I, I for sure agree with you. I thought, you know, uh, Hopkins, even, you know, though he it seemed like he got into more of a rhythm by the end of the game. You look at his stat line, he really did not do that much damage to the Jaguars. And, uh, I mean, even talking about the Jaguars' defensive issues and, you know, stopping Watson, the Texans only had nine points at halftime, you know. So, and I, I mean, I, I feel like the game did not really unravel until that messed up field goal attempt in the third quarter. I mean, is, is that when you kind of felt things kind of got out of hand? Well, it's like – it's it just – it feel it felt like the Jags had every opportunity and every chance in the entire world to be – involved in that game they have a excellent kicker in Josh Lambeau and then they just mess up on the I think it was a messed up hold I think wasn't it or something like that but um yeah that was really the backbreaker that's what that's what broke the yeah. drags and I think after that it was just it was a wrap after that yeah yeah I, th I think Marone said afterward he he didn't he didn't exactly say bad snap but he was like yeah that was one of the best holds I've ever seen so <laughs> I'm just gonna go ahead and say that that was probably one of the worst snaps I think that he was trying to say he'd ever seen in, in other words but um I, I I think so too and I don't know, it just it seemed like they did not, you know, that they, they didn't come to play on Sunday, you know, for better or worse. And uh, against the Texans, you just can't do that, man. Texans are one of the best teams, in my opinion, from, you know, top to bottom in the league. Uh, they get a lot of flack for some of the things they do, uh, a lot of it deservedly. But, man, I, I, Watson's a future MVP, probably multi-MVP, you know, in my eyes. And uh, I, I said on Twitter, it, it kind of feels like it did watching the Jaguars against the Colts when the Colts had Peyton Manning, you know? I mean, it really you, did. You, you just know this dude is going to be a problem two times a year, no matter how good you are. You know what I mean? Well, that's, that's how it is, too. And then uh, I think Houston also doesn't get enough respect for their coaching staff either. I think they have one of the best coaching staffs in the league. And I think, you know, they – they manage to get like all this talent and you pair them up with guys like Romeo Cronell. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Couldn't even yeah. speak right there, but you know, you pair them up with these guys and um, you know, you're obviously if you got talented guys with guys that have been in the NFL for as long as they have, you're going to have a successful football team. And I think that's what they're building in Houston. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, 100%, 100%. And, I mean, you, you, you got to respect Bill O'Brien. Not many guys can, uh, you know, do a complete power play 
and still, you know, head coach's team to six and three in the same season while also, you know, shipping off of whichever players he wants to do, man. I, I, I respect the heck out of that. You know, he's, he's wheeling and dealing, uh, you know, game, game of Thrones behind the scene back there. He's wheeling and dealing picks. He's their pseudo GM and but he's still, he's still got them rolling as a team, dude. dude I mean, I, everybody killed them after a county trade, but, I mean, I, right now it seems like they've kind of won that trade, doesn't it? I'm telling you, dude. Like, it is – like, when we play teams inside of the AFC South, it gets frustrating because they're so good. But, like, when you just watch Houston play or when you just watch Indianapolis play, it's so hard to dislike them because they're so fun to watch and they're really, like, building something there. Like, I, I don't know. Like, if I wasn't such, you know, a diehard Jags fan or such, like, a follower of the team, like, I probably, you know – wouldn't mind watching a lot of Houston football games, but you yeah, know, that's yeah, the way she goes. for sure, for sure. All right, now uh, you know uh, after the Houston loss, uh, Jacksonville is now four and five uh, entering this week's bye week. Uh, they don't have a game on Sunday. Uh, entering four and five, uh, I'm going to ask you a, a question. It's basically the same question, but two different scenarios. Entering the season, if someone told you the team was four and five at the bye week, would you? How would you feel about that? And then after Nick Foles went down, how would you feel about that same scenario? Prior to the season, if you told me that we went four and five heading into the bye week, I would say that makes sense. You know, I probably would have been like, okay, yeah, four and five. That sounds like a total Jaguar move, you know, to like, you know, get into these games where we lose by one possession. Because you kind of knew before the season started that like you, you're not going to beat Kansas City. You know, you're obviously going to drop a division game every here and there. So I think before the season started, like four and five sounded like what we were going to end up being or what the season was going to pan out. Now, after Nick Foles goes down, I would have expected the Jaguars to be nine and oh at the bye because Gardner Minshew's a god. Just kidding. I would not have expected that. No, I think (laughs) I think four and five is really good for where Gardner was at. Um, I think. As the season developed, I kind of expected the Jags to do more than four and five as it yeah. developed. But when he originally went down, you know, from seeing what Gardner did in the preseason, you know, probably three wins was the ceiling for, for me, I think. Yeah, yeah no, for sure. I, I, I think four and five, looking at it either way, I think that's not a bad spot to be in. Obviously, it's not ideal for any team, especially a team that's kind of trying to win now. Uh, anytime you're below 500 after halfway through season, it's not a great thing. But I think just considering the situation the Jaguars are in, you know, as well as Minshew played in some games, he he really got zero reps with the starters. A lot of people, you know, have been saying this week, well, he got reps all all uh, preseason and preseason games. Yeah, he did. But he was throwing two guys and having yeah. guys blocking for him. That aren't even in the league right now, okay? So he didn't get any reps with the starters, you know, the DJ Sharks, the D.D. Westbrooks, the, you know, Jawan Taylors, the Brandon Linders. He didn't get reps with those guys until that week one game against the Kansas City Chiefs and afterward. So if you had said, you know, hey, yeah, this guy's going to go four and four, even though, you know, he didn't look good at all in the preseason and he doesn't have any reps with these guys, I think everybody's pretty happy with that. And uh, j- just me coming into the season, I-, I was a little low on Jaguars total win loss projections in most. If you had said four and five after nine games, I'd been like, oh yeah, you know, I mean that that, that sounds about right, you know. I mean it's it's yeah. it's nothing it's it's nothing, uh, you know. I think it's too off base either way, and you know, I mean it's uh, it, it might not seem like it, but I still think it's a heck of a lot better than uh, you know like three and six. So, like, just imagine if they, like, lost that Broncos game right now. You know, I mean, their season really would be on life support. So, uh, you know, for for as much as people are saying Foles needs to save the season, I feel like the season already got – is already in the process of being saved, you know, if that, if that makes sense. I, I get what you're saying. And I think from just knowing, Min, like, about Minshew and Minshew's, you know, game and where he's been prior to, you know, coming to Jacksonville – I mean, if you tell me that he goes four and five or even like, you know, five and four, like I would say, you know, I can see that because the guy's truly a gamer. And like you, you hear that, you know, you're at the stadium, you've been to the press conferences, you know, like his head's in the playbook all the time. Like he's making sure that he can be the best football player that he can be because, you know, Minshew's a guy that, you know, I don't really think he expected to, 
you know, get this far, obviously. Like, he's a guy that just wants to keep on playing football. So, I think even if he was playing, like, in, like, the Canadian Football League, like, this guy would still be going as hard as he's going. I think he's just, you know, he's a one-of-a-kind, like, person. I think he yeah. uh, does a lot, does a lot yeah. to and, learn. And what I can say, you know, for uh, being there and what I think maybe a lot of people don't realize – He's a, well, first of all, super genuine person. And then second of all, all this, you know, Minshew mania and the memes and stuff, that's not stuff he's out there, you know, creating and pushing, you know. It kind of – it comes with the fanfare. That dude's yeah, 100% exactly. football, dude. He is a 100% football, you know. I mean, he, he, he he's all ball. He doesn't focus on any of that stuff. And I saw somebody, like, tweet at me. And they're like, oh, well, he plays better when people aren't pushing the Minshew mania thing. And I'm like – I can't think that even is one percent of what is on his mind on Sundays. No. You know, that's no, just not, not how the dude's wired. Not at all. And I mean, like, it's just it's based off of a personality. Like, I mean, the guy grew up in Mississippi, like the jorts and all that, and the yeah. mustache. Like, that's just that's just what people look like in Mississippi. You feel me? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Now, uh, the what, what areas of the team that do you think needs to improve the most over the bye week? to give Jacksonville a chance uh, to make the postseason. I, I, I've, wrote, I've written about it a little bit this week, but uh, just from my perspective, I think the offense is going to need to, you know, for, you know, as much as I've loved what Minshew has done as a quarterback, I think he's flashed some great things. When you look at the advanced statistics of the Jaguars offense, it hasn't been a good offense. It's been explosive at times. It's been fun, entertaining, but has it been a good offense? Not, not really, you know. It, it kicks too many field goals, hasn't scored enough touchdowns, haven't put together enough long drives. So, really, that's my thing uh, coming out of the bye week. I think the offense in general needs to see an uptick in production. But I think, like you had mentioned earlier, especially in the red zone, I think that's where Foles is going to have to be huge. But uh, what area of the team do you think needs to make a jump after the bye? I think you, you hit the nail right on the head with almost everything that you said. I think the major thing – is red zone efficiency. Yeah, is it cool that the Jaguars have, like, the best kicker in the league and Josh Lambeau? Yes, it's awesome. It's awesome to see Lambeau do well, and it's awesome to see, you know, he's breaking his own records, he's doing good things. But when you're in the NFL, you're playing football, you need to get touchdowns because touchdowns win games. And the Jags just lack that. And, you know, whether that comes down to play calling, play on the field, you know, argue that all you want. You got, you know, calling a pitch play to Leonard Fournette at the one-yard line. Uh, I think that was in the Bengals game, you know, when he was trying to yeah, get – Yeah, no, uh, uh, Jets game, yeah. Jets game, yeah, there we go. When he was trying to get his uh, second touchdown of the season. Yeah. And, you know, it's just crazy to me that we've been in the red zone X amount of times and just Leonard Fournette only has one rushing touchdown. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, no, it really does. And, you know, that kind of segues perfect into – my next topic, but just, when it comes to Leonard Fournette, dude, you look at all of his stats this season, just the regular stats and then the advanced statistics like, you know, missed tackles, uh, successful run percentage, stuff like that. He is blowing all of his career numbers out of the water because he's on, he's already matched almost all of his numbers from his rookie season, sans touchdowns. He is so much better in every area except scoring touchdowns. And it's weird because in his first two years, scoring touchdowns was kind of the thing that he was best at, honestly. Like, it felt, like, his... he, it felt like he was so money on the goal line. Is, is that something you've kind of uh, have noticed or anything this year? And why do you think it is that he struggled to get into the end zone the way he has? You know, I think that was – because I didn't even – really know because you know I'm not I'm not really like writing down like the stats and all that stuff like you are yeah. and I didn't really know he only had one touchdown until about like two weeks ago yeah and, yeah. I, and that blew me away and I think it comes down to um play calling and I think I, I could be wrong and I don't know like the percentage but I think the Jags have tried to pass in the red zone a lot more this season than they did in previous seasons because they know that Gardner you know could at least attempt to try and fit it in there because you know he he fits the ball in some tight windows and you know when Blake Bortles was the quarterback for the Jags he, and oh, I guess you can't really make that argument because Bortles was really effective in the red zone actually. yeah it, it, it was weird man he's bizarro Minchu. they're literally good at all of the opposite things <laughs> yeah. 
it doesn't make sense dude like i mean like you asked me to like sit here and and tell you you know what it is like why it it is how it is i i don't think i can man i really don't know it's bizarre bizarre. i I got one for you if i told you that leonard Fournette was second in the entire nfl in red zone carries uh does that sound accurate to you hell no yeah he he is bro 35 35 red zone carries in the league second in the league He's behind Ezekiel Elliott, who has 39. He has six touchdowns. Dalvin Cook has only 31 red zone carries, less than Leonard Fournette, and he has eight touchdowns. So they're giving the dude the ball. It just is not working. And I I think it's a mix of things, but I can't pinpoint it. And my thing is I'm not sure if they have been able to pinpoint it yet. You know what I mean? Just because – we, we haven't seen it really change. And uh, with, with that said, I do think he got robbed against the Jets. That play right yes, before the toss. Yes, I do too. That play right before the toss, that was a touchdown, man. They blew the whistle so early on that. I'm like, I agree. D- 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 dude was pushing his way into the end zone and they blew the whistle. Well, my favorite part of that whole play was freaking Gardner Minshew and his huge thighs came in <laughs> to push the pile. Yeah. Dude, that, 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 that play was amazing, bro. That was their own, like, uh, bush push or whatever. It, it, it was an incredible play. And then, you know, next play, it, it, that's kind of been the story of Leonard, you know, Fournette's uh, season in terms of scoring the ball, you know. Uh, the refs uh, basically screw him out of one touchdown. Then he loses seven yards on the next run because they decided so with toss, dude. Like, I, I'd be well, frustrated, too. I think I think some of it might have to do with the fact that, you know, they – He's been in the league now, you know. Everybody knows the style of runner that Leonard Fournette is. They know that he's this big, bruising running back. And if they get down into the goal line, the Jaguars are going to try and give Leonard Fournette the ball. And it might just be, a, just, you know, a simple concept of people just knowing what Leonard's going to do. I mean, for example, I can't really pinpoint what game it was, but he tried to do the thing that he always does against Pittsburgh. where Yeah, he the, just, the leap. Yeah, where he leaps and he just gets met like yeah. right in the air. Yeah, that was a like, people. Uh, people I, just know what he's doing at this point. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. I I truly hate myself that I can pinpoint exactly the situation a game that was. <laughs> uh, it was a first drive of the Bengals game. They went for it on fourth and down from the one right after. That's DJ what it Trump was. Got yeah, yeah. Pass. yeah it, it, ter- terrible recall talent of mine. I, unfortunately, I can do that for like half of the Gus Bradley era games. It, 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 it's not a good talent to have but yeah i can but, pinpoint moments but i can't tell you like the first drive or like you know doing yeah that, but. yeah but um now just just in terms of fernet how cool has his development been uh this season to you like uh, hey. and, and just just both you know as a player and then you know as you know maturity wise because the thing that comes that i keep coming back to is not only is he a better player this season we talked about how he's already on pace to blow all of his receiving and rushing stats out, out of the water but you know the, that Jets game when Brian Poole was clapping in his face and the ref threw yep. the flag before picking it up for whatever reason I feel like Leonard Fournette last year would not have let him just clap on his face like that I feel well, like guy, this yeah go ahead the guy the guy was more of a boxer than a football player last year you know, yeah you know yeah. what I mean yeah and, for sure bro and I think you know, you might you might even be getting tired of it because I think every article I have written for you at this point, I have talked about how happy I am to see Leonard Fournette grow as a person. I don't know what exactly is going on. I think maybe he's – like, because you would think with, like, the whole Telvin Smith situation, the whole Jalen Ramsey situation, like, you would think Leonard Fournette would be a guy that would be right there with him. But, you know, I think he, he might have gotten some, you know, words from, like, maybe a guy like Yannick Ngakwe, who Yannick Ngakwe is another guy that could fall under to the same trap and just be like, oh, this Tom Coughlin situation, like, I don't even want to play football, trade me. But, you know, he's going out there, he's earning his bag. And, you know, I think I think Leonard just – I think the whole Wyoming thing, the whole I, – I, I was going to say, I, I feel like Leonard – and he's tweeted about it a few times, but I think his switch flipped when he got arrested for those uh, parking tickets or, you yeah. know, the whatever last year. And I think that's when, like, he kind of took it upon himself, like, okay, it, I, I need to, you know, you know, uh, take my maturity and my game to another level because I'm not trying to, you know, have things keep going like this. And, you know, it, it's it's a credit to him. Um, do, do, 
do you think they pick up his option after this season? That's been, I feel like, one of the tougher questions to ask. If they did pick up his option, it'd be around $10 million for a season, uh, his fifth season. Do you see them picking that up? Do I think they should? Probably. I yeah. think with what he's done this year, and if he does what he's on pace to do, I think that, you know, this is a guy that, you know, you kind of are building your whole entire offense around. Like, this is a guy that's critical to your offense. And it's not like the Jags right now have a running back that could just take over and be that guy. You look at every single team in the NFL, almost every single team has a running back that is really good and they can rely on. And yeah. Leonard Fournette's that type of guy. You know, you don't want to be the team that doesn't have a running back that can get you that thousand yards, that can catch passes out of the backfield. I think Leonard Fournette is really important to the team. So I think they should pick up yeah. his fifth year option. But with how this team has been with paying players, you know, you really, you really don't. Yeah, I, I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head when you say he's important to the team. I think not only in terms of what they do on offense, but I feel like in terms of uh, leadership and identity, I do feel like Leonard Fournette is important to the Jacksonville Jaguars inside the Jacksonville Jaguars building at TIA Bankfield. Uh, whether or not he gets his option picked up, I truly don't know. Uh, my, my personal guess, uh, this is just me going from the gut, shooting off the hip. I do not think he gets his option picked up, but I think they work out a deal with him. That's uh, it's not going to be close to the Zico Elliott deal, but it's it, it, it it's going to be you know respectable. But that's just my guess. But um, you know we we talked about one uh one contract. Let's uh go ahead and talk about uh uh one other one. Uh, this time on the defensive side, you mentioned it a little bit, but uh uh Unique and Gakwe, you know uh him and Josh Allen this year, they've just been an awesome pass rushing duo, man. I mean. The, the 11, like, combined, you know, 11 sacks, 11 tackles for loss, uh, you know, three forced fumbles, an interception return for a touchdown. And then that's not even counting the times that they're creating plays, you know, for the other guys on the team. Because there's been a few times this year where Yannick or Josh Allen have directly pressured the quarterback into another defensive lineman. So yeah. I, 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 I think it's already, you know, I don't think it's a hot take at all to say that that duo is already better than Ngakwe Fowler duo. Uh, is, would you agree with that? Oh, dude, I can't even like because I back in my glory days in high school football, I was a defensive end. So you know, I have I have a lot of love for pass rushers in this league. And how crazy is it that Josh Allen is 21 years old? How crazy is that? Like it like with how big this guy is and like. Dude how how he has his instinct for the football he's only 21 uh, i i i i got my i got my comparison for him and i don't care how hyperbolic it sounds but i got this from watching a uh, ball uh not it wasn't even baldy's breakdown actually it was uh man he's with espn he's one of the film guys I, uh, matt bowen that's who it is matt bowen he's with a espn nfl matchup he tweeted out a uh, all twenty two coaches from the angle of Josh Allen against the Jets, and yeah. it was it was the second sack, and it was just a beautiful sack, man. He gets upfield, he dips and rips and gets low to the ground, oh, and then yeah. he spins back inside. You know, spins back inside when he realizes what a quarterback is and gets the sack. Dude, he looked like Demarcus Ware from that play to me. You know, that's I a think, good. That's a good one. I think he can be that kind of player. I really do, and. For the Jaguars to have that kind of player across them in Gokwe, who's already been one of their most productive pass rushers ever, I I think that's something that you need to keep around as long as you can, you know? I mean, we, we, we talked a little bit about uh, rookie quarterback contracts being such a huge, uh, you know, beneficiary. I think Josh Allen being on a rookie contract is the same deal. You know what I mean? I, I agree with that 100%. And, God, man, it's it's. I've said this a lot this year. I think the Jaguars, with how much they've invested in this defensive line and how much they really have in there, there's. I think they have the best defensive line in football. I think you got guys that are on this team that all do different things exceptionally well. And the fact that they were able to get Josh Allen at the seventh overall pick, I mean, 
I, I didn't see a lot of people being upset about the pick. I wasn't upset about the pick, but if anybody, you know, was and thought, oh, we already have Calais and Yan or whatever, why do we need to bring in Josh Allen? I hope you realize that the reason we're bringing in Josh Allen is because, you know, why – imagine coming into a game being a left and a right tackle and knowing you have to go up against Yannick Ngakwe and Josh Allen and – that is like on lock for however many years. And if we extend Yan, you know, and Josh stays on his rookie deal for next two, three years, like that is something they're going to have to deal with for a long time. And I think that, uh, you know, things like that is why Codwell's keeping his job. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I, I, I agree with you there. I think that's a, I think that's honestly a pretty good point just because, it, when you're able to hit on pass rushers like that, it can make up, you know, for some of, you know, the misses in the past just because that that's such an important group, you know. Um, all right, we'll, we'll go ahead and go shift into, uh, you know, we've got a couple of Twitter questions. Uh, you know, at any time we do a show, uh, I'll go ahead and tweet out from our Twitter account. That's at Jaguar Maven. I'll go ahead and uh, send out a tweet letting you know that we're about to record and you can uh, send us any questions if you want. Uh, for our first show, we got a couple of uh, questions that, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, each uh, good conversations to have. Uh, the first one is uh, from uh, my dude, uh, E. Dilla, uh, Eric Dilla, also, also known as the Dillical. He, uh, he he wants to know, in what ways do you expect the offense to change after the quarterback switch? So uh, I, go ahead and give me your quick take on that, tree, and then I'll give you mine. First of all, the, uh, the Dilla is part of the – bold take podcast or the bold city podcast whatever and i love it i love it they kill it they kill it it cracks me up i think they do a really good job of mixing uh football with comedy i think they do a good job yeah but um i think that the red zone efficiency you know we've kind of talked about that earlier i think the red zone efficiency steps up i think um the willingness to kind of take some shots is going to step up too because like you said earlier, you know, uh, John DeFilippo said uh, it was harder to tailor this offense around Gardner Minshew. Um, and now that he knows that Foles has had his head in the playbook, they tailored this offense for him. I think you're going to see, you know, a lot more like shot plays, a lot more opportunities to have bigger plays happen. And I think um, – I mean, like, I don't want to, I don't want to crap on Minshew because I thought he did a great job, but I just think like efficiency overall is going to yeah, step up. Yeah, offense. yeah. In, in terms of style of offense, I think, like you mentioned, uh, it's going to change with a lot more vertical throws. Uh, we saw Minshew have a lot of success on deep throws, but I feel like his deep attempts weren't quite up there, especially the last few games. I think Foles is really going to push it down the field, and I think. They're going to call for a lot of times for Foles to push it down the field, at least more so, more so than Minshew was doing. Uh, I think it's going to be less of an offense kind of on the move just because, you know, Foles, he's not the mobile quarterback Minshew is, you know. No. He is much more of a, you know, traditional pocket passer. And then I, I think you see more uh, kind of uh, RPOs, honestly. I, 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 yeah. I, I think you see a lot more of that just because that was kind of a Nick Foles staple in Philadelphia. And – even though Minshew's a bit of a running threat, you didn't really see that 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 many uh, you know run pass options uh, with him. So I think that's I think that's going to be a big thing that changes, and that's one reason why I I too think uh, Leonard Fournette can actually benefit from the quarterback switch, even though he's already having a good season. You know, and I and I would honestly kind of make the argument that Gardner Minshew isn't necessarily like a mobile quarterback. I would say that like he's a guy that is able to extend plays inside the pocket with his legs. And um, so I don't know. I just, I've, I've seen a lot of people like kind of say that Minshew's a mobile quarterback, but I would mm-hmm. say that that's kind of not, not necessarily. It, it, it's kind of weird. Cause he, he doesn't, he doesn't have like the speed or like the makeup of one. But when yeah. you look at like quarterback scramble yards, I think he's like number two or something like that. It's, it's something bonkers like that. Like he's like, there goes like Lamar, then there's a big gap, and then there's Minshew in terms of like quarterback well, running production. Yeah, and it's like it's like what do you even call? Do you call him a mobile quarterback? I guess you really don't really have another yeah. word to explain it. But I but I knew where you were coming from. Yeah, just, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. And he, he he's just a guy. He can create out of structure, 
so well. And I, I, I think that's been the biggest reason why, you know, he's played as well, uh, you know, as he has. Okay, we'll go ahead and go to our uh, next question. Our next question is uh, from uh, Kahuna Med uh, on Twitter. He goes, uh, does Josh Oliver actually exist? That is a question that we have gotten. I've yeah. gotten, at least uh, as a writer, at least uh, God, man, a dozen different times this season. Uh, for, for those listening, Josh Oliver was a Jaguars third-round pick at tight end this season, uh, went to San Jose State. He missed the first uh, six games of the season with a uh, hamstring injury before playing in week seven against the Bengals. And, uh, I mean, uh, since then he's caught two passes for 10 yards on uh, four targets per pro football reference. So he really hasn't had that big impact yet. Uh, he he definitely exists. I can confirm that. Uh, Tree, do you think he's going to have a big impact at uh, any point this season? Uh, well, dude, from the from the way you were talking about Josh Oliver, it sounded like you were even a little confused that he existed. It sounded like you were reading that right off of his Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm just um, programmed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Josh Oliver, man. Uh, I wasn't high on him when the Jags drafted him. Um, I... I just don't think a tight end like Josh Oliver is fits what the Jaguars run. I was really impressed with James O'Shaughnessy this year. You know, he ended up getting hurt, but I, I want to just give my boy James O'Shaughnessy some love and a shout out because I thought he, he had a good uh, season put together. And I think that yeah he should always kind of be the starting tight end. And, you know, Josh Oliver, I mean – I don't know. You, does he exist? You know, that's a great question because it's like we haven't seen enough of him to really formulate a real opinion on him. But um, I like James O'Shaughnessy more. And, you know, they've, they've been playing guys like Seth the Valve more. So they're obviously – either he's still a little banged up or, you know, the, the coaching yeah. staff don't yeah. really – I, 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 I think they're still trying to ease him in just because he missed so much time, honestly. Because I, I do think they're really high on him, uh, you know, because uh, – you talk to the coaches and the people inside the building and they rave about him just because he's that big body dude. He has speed for his size. You can line him up in slide or line him up on in line. He just, it has to actually happen during a game. You know, I, I, I I, I'm going to go ahead and go with my hot take. I say he catches three touchdowns over the next seven games with Foles at the helm. Ooh, that's a good yeah. hot take. F- Foles loves his tight ends, bro. So I, I, I don't know if any of other of his numbers are going to be good, but I'm saying he catches three touchdowns. All right. Uh, let's go to our third question. This one is from, let's see, Duval Jaguars. He asked, uh, why do we constantly get off to a bad start? And, uh, you know, of course he's referring to, it seems like every Jaguars game this season, Sands, like, man, the Jets game. And the Titans game, the Jaguars have gotten off to a bad start and they had to work their way back into the game. Uh, wh- wh- why do you think that is? I, I think game planning, man. We talked about that earlier too. Like I just – some some games it just seems like like the Jaguars have like no idea who they're playing sometimes. Like it seems like – like I'm trying to think of an example. For an example, like the Houston game, like this, just this last week, I mean you – couldn't stop Carlos Hyde in the run game last week. I mean, the last time he played him. And then you go in against him this time, and he has like 160 yards rushing. He does even better than he did the first go around. It's like, yeah, I think it comes down to game planning and scheming. And I just, I think as far as that goes, the Jags are one of the worst teams in the NFL at doing that. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I think I'd probably agree with you there. And they just too many times the, game gets away from them early I I I think on offense they just get terrible field positioning in a lot of these games like the Saints game I feel like when you get the ball for the first time in the game like at like the three yard line I feel like that just throws all your scripted plays out the window you know what I mean so I I I think that's played a part of it but I, I definitely think you know when a team consistently is having to work itself back into a game and not starting off fast that you got to look at, you know, you got, you got to obviously look at uh, the, the coaching factors in it and you have to look at, okay, who specifically, what parts of the team are kind of starting off slow. And I feel like the offense, uh, you know, for a lot of weeks was that part of the team that was starting off slow. There was a few weeks in there, that it was the defense and that 
at, at the end of the day, they just need to figure out that consistency level over the, you know, final seven games. Uh, the hope is that with a veteran quarterback at the helm, that will bring kind of some consistency on its own. But uh, that's something we're going to have to, you know, kind of wait and see. All right, so uh, moving to our final uh, segment of the show, uh, we'll go ahead and talk about some uh, predictions for after the bye week and final hot takes. Uh, Treve, I'm just asking you a few different questions. and Just go ahead and give me your, your prediction, and uh, then we can each give away, uh, you know, some of our final hot takes uh, until the, the next episode, you know, get, give the people what they want. Stay tuned towards the end because I have a steaming hot take for you. All right, let's <laughs> try. All right, uh, pre- prediction: uh, Do the Jaguars go five and two over the next seven games? Yes or no? No. No. What What, what are you feeling? So five and two. I think they four and three. Yeah, four I was going to say. And four. I, I was going to say. I feel like four and three is a, a a good like a good guess right now. But my thing is, my head is telling me four and three. My gut is telling me four and three. All the logic is telling me four and three. I cannot get over Nick Foles playing an elimination game. So I just feel like it's right. set up for him to make make me look stupid. But I, I, I'm gonna go four and three with the stamp on it that I am fully aware of Nick Foles can spaz in elimination games and that he very well make me look stupid. So. I, I, I just want to put that little disclaimer with it. Doesn't doesn't this like this next like coming off the bye week? Doesn't it feel like a whole new season? It does. Like, it feels completely different. Like it, like my excitement level to see like a lot of people are pissed to see Nick Foles play, but I'm really excited. I'm yeah, really. Yeah, no, I'm. I'm. I'm uh, uh, I'd say my word is really. I'm. I'm really intrigued. Honestly, I'm. I'm interested to see how this offense looks like him because. We haven't seen really flip with his his offense, the offense that he came into the season wanting to do. We haven't really seen that really this year, you know, at all. So I'm I'm honestly fascinated to really see how he looks. Um, okay, uh, next prediction: Does Gardner Minshew start another game for Jacksonville this season? Yes or no? No. No. No, he does not. I yeah. think. I I think Foles does good. I think Foles does his job. Yeah, you, you, uh, and I. I agree with you in terms of uh, I don't think Minshew comes back in because of performance for any reason. The mm-hmm. only reason I think he'd come back in is if Foles got banged up again. And that's not really something you can, you know, predict at all. So I, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. I don't, I don't think Foles gets uh, pulled for performance reasons at really any point. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, Doug Marone, is he the coach of the Jaguars in 2020? Yes or no? I think he's the coach for the Jaguars until 2024. I, yeah. I like Doug Marone, man. Wow. I, wow. 2024. <laughs> I will defend Doug Marone yeah. against anybody. Yeah. I literally will. I, I love I, I love him. I, I, what, what record do you think he needs to get at to uh, be the coach past the season? Uh, or, do you, or do you think they give him the mulligan year because Foles got hurt? I think reg- like if he goes five and eleven, I think he gets let go. Yeah, but I think even like six and ten, like I think he still sticks around. Yeah, man. I mean, I I think just objectively, you know, with the Ramsey debacle and Foles going down with injury, I think he's done a decent job for the team this season. You know, just you know, objectively looking at it, you know, non biased, I think he has done a solid job this season as coach. You know what I mean? Well, I. That's kind of what I'm saying. Like, I feel like all the internal issues, and obviously, you know, I have no idea what they actually are, but it feels like none of it is linked to Doug Marone. Like, it seems like the players actually want to play for him, and they actually respect him a lot. So yeah, I, I'm going to say you. Doug Marone, uh, he's going to be the coach for the Jags for at least three, four more years. All right, I hear you. All right, final one, final one. Yannick Ngakwe, does he get extended before the season is over? Yes or no? Oh, he better. I'm going to say yes. Yeah. Because, because if he doesn't, then he's going to go. I, I'm calling it now. If he does not, if we do not extend him, he's going to go play for Houston or Indianapolis, and we are going to regret it for the for I, the rest ever. I've been saying, dude, if he's a free agent, he's 100% going to be a cold. Like, 
Yeah, that that's a lock, dude. He's like exactly the kind of like pass rusher they like, you know. So I I, I uh, I'm I, I'm gonna say no. He does not get an extension before the really? season's over. Yeah, I think he'll be on the team next season. Uh, I I haven't decided yet if I think it's gonna be on a new deal or on the franchise tag. So I do think he'll be here next season, but I don't think a deal gets done during the season now. All right, uh, let, let, let's move into, uh, you know, uh, g- give me your parting shots. You know, your, uh, give, give me your last couple of hot takes that you have that you maybe weren't able to get off your chest uh, during the other parts of the show. Okay, so I have, I think, two that I really just want to say that I feel. One is put some respect on Jared Wilson's name. I think Jared Wilson – has put together a really, really solid season. He was just missing the part where he made a big splash play that really stood out to, you know, the, the fans or like stood out as a play that he made himself. And that that strip at the end of the game on Carlos Hyde, like though the Jags were down and, you know, out of it, Jared Wilson made that play. And I, yeah. it, he's, he's been waiting to make some sort of play like that for a long time. And, it's underrated. Yeah. The safety duo between Ronnie Harrison and Jared Wilson, I think, is really, really solid. And I agree. I think I agree. more people need to respect Jared Wilson. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, I, I have, uh, you know, two hot takes uh, myself. Uh, my, my initial hot take is uh, I think second year in the NFL, DJ Chark is going to be – better than Allen Robinson was for the Jaguars. And I say this as somebody who was a huge Allen Robinson fan. Just, I, I loved his game, you know, his route running, his ability to make contested catches. I think Chark can do most of the things he can do, but I think he can also beat you with more speed than A-Rob could. So I, 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 I think A-Rob is their kind of redemption chance at the Allen Robinson situation. Okay, I like that. Yeah. And and here's my hot take that no one's going to agree with, but I have I have a feeling Taven Bryan mm-hmm. is going to finish the year with five sacks. Dude, I'm a Taven Bryan guy. I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm a Taven Bryan fan right now, bro. He he's legitimately fun to watch right now. You know, it's crazy, man. He's pushing these like guards like right into the quarterback's yeah. lap. It's like where was this at last year? Yeah. He, he, he was popping, like, even though, you know, the Jaguars gave up 26 points, he was flashing a lot against the Texans, dude. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm with you. I'm a big Taven Bryan guy. All right, uh, my, my uh, final hot take, I, I, I'm going to say Leonard Fournette finishes the season with, man, less than five rushing touchdowns. I don't know how hot of a take that is, because considering he only has one right now, I'm going to go with the fact that it's a hot take just because he's having such a good season otherwise, and he's such a talented player. I think they're going to have a lot more passing touchdowns and rushing touchdowns with Nick Foles at the helm. You know, I think uh, honestly, I think that they're going to air it out even more with Foles than they did with Minshew. I, I also kind of I don't. I also want to get your thoughts because I seen you wrote on it. Yeah, what do you what do you think about Calais Campbell's statement that Nick Foles would be an MVP race right now if he was still in? I mean, it, it's the you know kind of statement where you know even Calais he's like, hey, you can't tell me I'm wrong because who knows? You know, what I mean, <laughs> like, I mean, I'm like, hey, man, I, I I respect that level of take where you're like, hey, you can never <laughs> prove that this take was incorrect. You know. I, I, I love that level of take here in Kung Calais. Uh, it, That's it, so funny. Yeah, it is bad. And, and, and uh, it, you know, in terms of I agree with it or not, I, I don't think he'd be putting up MVP numbers, but I think, I think he'd probably be having a solid season, you know? Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, um, uh, Treve, you got uh, it, uh, it, anything else, uh, you know, for folks? Um, I have no more Jags takes, but make sure you uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's Treeb Talks. We post four Jaguar videos a week, and there's going to be more just uh, overall content over there on YouTube. Make sure you follow me on Twitter for really hot uh, wrestling takes, really hot uh, J- 
jog takes and you know probably every once in a while uh some some drunk treep takes so you know <laughs> it's a good time over there on treep talks is twitter and youtube so make sure you follow that and i want to thank john for putting me on i think this is a it was been a great opportunity to write for the site and uh, to do this podcast is even a, another great opportunity so i gotta my hat's off to mr john shipley oh thanks bro i appreciate it and uh yeah you can definitely go ahead and follow treep he's uh, been a big part of the jaguar maven team uh this season definitely expect for that to continue i I, I I can't say enough, you know, good things about the guy. And if, if you know me, I, I uh, you know, throw, throw a decent amount of shade in my life. So if I'm <laughs> throwing you compliments, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're at a good spot. But uh, I, I appreciate everybody listening. You know, it's the first episode of the Jaguar Maven podcast. Uh, you know, we're going to continue to, you know, uh, grow with it and, you know, hit our groove as we go. Uh, baby steps, baby steps. But <laughs> uh, uh, thanks again, everybody. Uh, you can follow the account at Jaguar Maven uh, and then uh, si.com slash uh, Jaguars. That will take you right to us. We we post uh, about four articles a day minimum just between all of us. Uh, so we try to have a lot of content uh, for everybody, especially, you know, on game days and throughout the week. Uh, I'm at the stadium uh, about four or five times a week, like I said, uh, giving you all, you know, that Sports Illustrated coverage, but with an actual Jaguar Jeep reporter. That's something, to my knowledge, Jacksonville has never had before. So that, that's that's just what we're trying to bring to Jaguar fans. We're trying to bring you all a new, uh, you know, venue for analysis, uh, news, and uh, just, uh, you know, enjoyable takes, you know. And I uh, hope you all had a good time listening to the first show, and uh, make sure to tune in next time. All right, peace out, guys.